Today with Joseph Prince. You need to know that God loves you. But God is holy. And God cannot allow sin to come into His presence. Just like you have someone you love who has cancer. The cancer is in the person. If I ask you the question, do you hate the cancer? You say yes. How much do you hate? Depending on how much you love the person. The key to answered prayer is that you want God glorified. But let me tell you about God's glory. Every time you read the Bible that Jesus healed someone, they glorified God. Or many times in the Bible it says that, not every time, all right? But God always gets the glory when someone gets healed. Isn't that wonderful? And, 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 and the people rejoiced, and the people gave glory to God, and God was glorified. Amen. Healing glorifies God. Isn't that wonderful? So you can pray for God's glory. Pray for His glory. And don't worry about your name being vindicated. Before you can appreciate grace, you must understand the severity of God. God is a holy God. Then you can appreciate what He did. All right, there's no need for the cross. All right, show them 2 Thessalonians 1. Verse 6 to 10. Okay, verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Now, this is an awesome uh, 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 statement. All right, God says, uh, God will, it, it, it'll be righteous for God to trouble those who trouble you. And that's why we need to pray that God, you know, God forgive them. When someone troubles you, someone lies about you, cheats or try to harm you, God says, He will trouble them. Are you listening? And it'll be a righteous thing for him to do. Wow. All right? So God says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who, don't, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is not for believers. He's telling you that Jesus is returning. This is not the rapture. The second coming of Christ is coming back. And how is He coming back? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who reject His grace, those who spurn His grace, those who make a mockery of grace. You know, grace is not something cheap, people. The fire of God fell on the victim on that cross because God loves us. Jesus, the victim, went to the cross because He loves us. Amen. And the fires of judgment for us, the guilty ones, fell on Jesus Christ. And the, Bi and the Bible says that if we reject that, we make a mockery of that. The day is coming when His second coming, right, when He comes back for Israel, when He comes back to establish His millennial rule, He will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not obey uh, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The way we obey the gospel is by believing that He died for our sins. And all of you have done that, right? At least most of you. Okay, so remember that. Now, the next verse says, this, this ones who reject Him, this Christ rejecting world, shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. This shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Say everlasting. everlasting. The word everlasting is ionyost. The reason I'm, I'm telling you this is because right now, with what God is doing with grace, and grace is the gospel, people. It's called the gospel of grace and peace. It's not called any other gospel, the gospel of grace and peace. With God restoring the gospel of grace to the world, not through Pastor Prince. God sovereignly did it. Pastor Prince is only one of the many voices. But God is restoring the gospel of grace. The judgment that we see happen to people, all right, uh, that come against the gospel of grace, like Elimus the sorcerer was busy sorcerizing, nothing happened to him. But the moment he tried to hinder Paul from preaching the gospel of grace to the deputy of the city, he was struck blind. Sorcerizing, oh, I, I'm, I'm coining the word, I know. Sorcerizing is not something that, that God approves. In fact, it's an abomination, yet nothing happened to him. But the moment he hindered the gospel, something happened to him. So the, the so-called, in the age of grace, the judgments that we see are judgments of coming against grace, hindering grace, making a mockery of grace, denigrating grace. Are you listening? All right, the Bible says if, if under law they, they were judged, 
without mercy. How much more those who reject the voice from heaven and the verse before that says the voice in heaven speaks better things than the voice of Abel. And it says that it's a fearful looking for of judgment. If you reject grace, there's no other grace. There's no other, no other provision for you. But a fearful looking for and a fiery indignation, a fiery indignation. That literally happened also to the Jews, all right, uh, who rejected him in AD 70 when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple. But here it's talking about hell, everlasting destruction. Now it's very popular among so-called some grace preachers to say there is no hell. One movie, the author of it believes there's no hell. He says hell is a restorative place. The fire is restorative. He's a very famous author, all right? The author is a universalist. He believes everybody will be saved at the end. Everybody will be saved. My friend, that is not the gospel. Everybody is not automatically saved. Are you listening? All right, you make a mockery of the blood of Jesus. You make a mockery of missionaries everywhere. You make a mockery of the Word of God. And then they're, they're, among these universalists who say that everybody is safe, they will say hell is temporary. All right, hell, hell is restorative. All right, the fire there is to, to, to burn away all the bad things. No, no, your only opportunity for the holy fire to burn anything out of your life is here, not after death. And, 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 and they'll tell you that the word eternal is not eternal. Ionios. They'll, they'll try to prove to you, razzle dazzle from here, from this authority, from that authority. My authority is the Word of God. Amen. If the Bible doesn't say it, well, they, well Ionios, uh, this scholar says uh, uh, Ionios can be an H. I agree. But when it applies to God, to the most pertinent verses, eternal life, it is eternal. It is, it is forever. W.E. Vines bears that out. Kenneth Woods bears that out. Let me show you, uh, uh, your judge for yourself because don't, don't leave this in the domain of people who just talk like Greek and all that and try to razzle-dazzle you. All right, so these people are saying that Ionos, lake of fire or eternal damnation is not eternal. It's only temporary. But here it says everlasting, Ionos destruction. Okay? When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was belief. So he's coming back coming back as judge, not to judge our, us, but judge a guilty world. Okay, watch this. This word, Ionios, everlasting. Is it everlasting or is it for a time? These people, universalists are saying it's only for a time. Therefore, they apply it to the lake of fire. It's only for a time. Oh, it's only for a time. Is that what the Bible says? Then you got a problem. If you use the word everlasting and you try to give a new definition to Ionios as temporary, then we got a problem because the same word Ionos is used in Romans 16 where it says uh, the commandment of the everlasting God, the everlasting God is Ionios Tios. Now you got a problem. If you have redefined Ionios as temporary, is God temporary? Same great word. All right. Hebrews says, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, eternal spirit, Ionios, Numa, Ionios is used here for the eternal spirit. So is God uh, temporary? Is the Holy Spirit temporary? Regardless of any new scholars that come and say, well, it can also mean temporary. Forget them. Go by the authority of the word. Is the Holy Spirit temporary? Is God temporary? No, of course not. And best of all, I love this. <laughs> you know, the Bible can define itself. You say, Pastor Brin, I do not know about Greek and all that. Never mind. If you read your Bible, depending on the Holy Spirit, you can also come to this conclusion very simply. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Ionios. So, Ionios is compared with temporary. So, according to them, this is how you should read. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are also temporary. So you don't have to know Greek. You just look at this passage. If you read it in the Holy Spirit, you know, Holy Ghost logic, you just look at it, you just compare, you know that God's definition of Ionos is eternal. And by the way, it includes your redemption. He obtained for us Ionos redemption. Jesus gives us Ionos life, eternal life. We cannot lose our salvation. He gives us eternal life. Amen? Can I have a good amen? Someone, Pastor Prince, you know, you, you cannot lose your salvation, but you can renounce it. And I always find that a problem because, because uh, it denigrates the work of Jesus. If you can renounce your salvation, 
there are people who renounce salvation, renounce Jesus and all that, but we do not know the circumstances they are in. We really don't, do not know. Let me ask you a question. Can a sinner renounce his sinnership? Can a sinner say, I don't want Jesus, I don't want God, but I don't want to be a sinner. I don't want Satan also. I'm my own man, captain of my destiny. I renounce Satan. Can he do that? But according to Christians, a Christian can renounce Jesus and he's gone. But a sinner cannot renounce Satan, he's still hanging around. Another thing, why is a sinner a sinner? A sinner is a sinner because Adam sinned. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are born sinners. I know it's not very popular to preach this nowadays, but you know, who cares? Preach it, Pastor Prince, amen? amen? Before you can appreciate grace, you must understand the severity of God. God is a holy God. Amen. Then you can appreciate what He did. Or else there's no need for the cross. So, what is it then? These people that are saying, you know, it's temporary, it's this and all that. You need to know that God loves you, but God is holy. And God cannot allow sin to come into His presence. Just like you have someone you love who has cancer. The cancer is in the person. If I ask you the question, do you hate the cancer? You say yes. How much do you hate? Depending on how much you love the person. The more you love the person, the more you hate it. If you listen to someone, a, a colleague, you know, share, sharing about a distant cousin who has cancer, it might not affect you so much. Why? You don't love the person. You might sympathize with your colleague, but with someone close to you, you hate the cancer to the degree you hate, you love the person. You know why God hates sin? Because God loves you. And sin is destroying you. It always destroys. So how come, how come now we are Christians? And how are we believers? How are we righteous? The Bible says, by one man's obedience, we are made righteous. Not my obedience. So we sin because we are sinners. We are sinners because of Adam's sin. Likewise, listen, all right? By one man's obedience, I am made righteous. Not even by my obedience. I cannot glory. By one man's obedience, I am made righteous. Now, can I? Can I, right now, say I renounce Jesus after I am made righteous? Is it eternal life or not? So that's, that's, that's the thing. They said, yes, you can renounce Jesus. Then you got a problem because a sinner cannot renounce Satan. A sinner cannot renounce his sinnership. The only way out of his sinnership is to accept Jesus Christ. Amen. So what we are saying in essence is that what the first Adam did is more powerful than what the last Adam did. I got a problem with that. I got a problem. Pastor Brink, don't, don't you believe free choice? But free choice didn't work for the sinner, did it? The, the sinner used his free choice to renounce Satan and Satan is still there. The, 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 the sinner used his free choice to renounce his sinnership. I don't want to be a sinner. I renounce my sinnership. But he's still a sinner. He used his free choice. So friend, we have an everlasting gospel. If any part of you believe you can lose your salvation, it's a miserable doctrine to believe in. All right? Nothing is so secure as to know that his work is perfect and his word is sure. His word tells us, I give them eternal life, not until their next sin. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. If you're going to argue about Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, don't forget, these two passages are from the book of Hebrews. And it pertains to people who have tasted the word of God, tasted the power of the world to come, taste, taste, taste that, just like Judas did when Judas walked with Jesus. He was a partner with the Holy Spirit, but he didn't have the Holy Spirit. He wasn't safe, all right? When he fell off, it was impossible to renew him to repentance, okay? That's not my sermon. Are y'all ready for the sermon? <laughs> It was all good, free, amen? Remember the, my last sermon, I ended, out, I ended on uh, Elijah discouraged, all right? He, he begged for God to, to kill him, right? And, and how, God, how God answered that prayer, right? <laughs> he's, the, he's the only one in the Old Testament besides Enoch that never died, amen? And how he went to heaven in a blaze of glory. I just try to imagine him, you know, the chair of fire coming down. That's better than, than being sick and then slowly dying and then finally dying, like most people would, would all right? At that time, he would just step into the chariot and then blast off. 
right into heaven. Oh man, the man who was discouraged, who asked God to kill him, to take away his life, how God answered his prayer. Amen. Amen. And by the way, he has never died. Elijah went up in a blaze of glory. But before he went, I want to go back to the story. Because there are great lessons for us to learn. We left him the last time in the cave, the cave Horeb. Remember? He went, he went not that he was sent. When God sent him to the brook Cherith, God sent him there. Provision was there. God sent him to the widow of Zarephath house. God sent him to Mount Carmel. But this time he went. All these other times at the word of God, but here at the word of a woman who threatened him. He fled. So God asked him, God never asked him this question when he was in Cherith, Zarephath, at Carmel. But now God asked him, Why are, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? So let's follow the story. And, and there was an earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not, remember I told you about the, the rock band, earth, wind, and fire? There was, there was wind, there was earth, there was fire, but the Lord was not in either, any of this. You know, we think that, that powerful miracles like Elijah, miracles of judgment and all that, will stir the people's hearts. It was an amazing um, a miracle, but, but uh, yet the people's hearts did not turn around. There were some remnant that believed, the 7,000 obviously, but as a whole, his ministry is what we call quote-unquote failure. He was that's what discouraged him, is it? It is, it, he was discouraged because the people didn't turn around en masse the way he expected them to. So he was discouraged. So God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And the Lord was not in the earth, wind, and fire, but after the fire, a still small voice. Now this is grace. Grace is despised because people say, you know, I heard someone say, uh, grace is mercy. For me, grace is mercy. Grace is not mercy. And that's why people despise it because they think that, oh, it's only for people who are failures, those who, are, who don't have a strong will, or people who are not disciplined, people who are not, not uh, committed Christians. So they depend on, on grace. That, that's an insult to the grace of God. Mercy is mercy. Even in the Greek, there are two different words, elios for mercy and charis for grace. You cannot put them together. Now, mercy in the Old Testament, many a times is grace. Chesed ve'emet. But you cannot put them together. It's not mercy. So we still don't understand grace. Okay, people? So it was the voice of grace. God is telling him, when all the razzle-dazzle and the outward show and the noise and the wind and the feelings is gone, what remains, Elijah, is grace. A soft tongue breaks the bone. Love will win more. You know, when God wants to break our hearts, he, use, he uses His kindness. And I had that happened to me many times. And when God is hard, all right, people get even stronger in their rebellion. So preachers need to believe this. At the first sign, when, when a preacher falls, from, uh, falls into sin, all right, I submit to you that 70%, 80% of preachers will say, well, that's what happens. He must be listening to messages of grace. Instead of saying, what kind of belief system does this, this brother have? Does he know that God loves him? Has he been watching pornography privately because he doesn't feel complete? He doesn't feel, you know, that God really loves him? Even surrounded with all the evidence of God's favor and blessing, deep down he feels insecure. Is it because as he was growing up, his father wasn't there? Now, some people don't like to, me preaching like this, but it's the fact. All these things can affect us. Rejection can produce lust. The problem of lust is not lust, it's rejection. As we grow up, if there's rejection, you've got a problem with lust in your future. So this guy needs grace. He may even say, talk about grace, but he doesn't know grace. If he knew grace, sin will have no power over him. Oh, that's another sermon altogether. I wish I have time, but look at the effect of grace. The effect of grace is this. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle. The moment you're in the you know you're in the presence of God, look at the reaction. Before that, I, I, I'm jealous for the I, Lord, I'm here because, you know, he, he's, he's, he's bold. But the moment the Lord appeared, and how did the Lord appear? As grace, he wrapped himself. That's worship. See the reaction? Grace produces true worship. It hides yourself. You don't talk about your, your, your achievements, your glories, what you have done, what you, 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 you. It's all about Him. And it's also, preachers, not about how bad people are. It's how good God is. You're going to make sure that our ministry is not about, you know, reciting people's sins. As we're about to see. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him, said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Next and he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. 
because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, one accusation, torn down your altars, second accusation, and killed your prophets with the sword, third accusation. I alone am left, Tiana, <laughs> and they seek to take my life. So watch this, watch this, okay? By the way, God is about to bring him back to heaven already in a blaze of glory. Like no other uh, honor that, that the other men of God have received. This man is favored by God. But God also wanted a lesson for all of us to learn because what happened in the cave is not kept in the cave. It's for us to learn. Now listen carefully. When he was preparing the 12 stones and put the wood on it and put the victim on it, fire came down and consumed everything. Am I right? Before the fire came, how did he pray? The prophets of Baal also prayed. God didn't hear their prayer. Or their God didn't hear their prayer. But when he prayed, God heard his prayer. You know how short was his prayer? You can time it one day. But his prayer is like this. He didn't talk about, God, answer, answer me, Lord, today by fire so that people will know I'm a prophet. He, he did not pray that. It's not an I prayer. Many times we want God to answer to vindicate us. But his prayer is this. God, answer that the people here may know that there is a God in Israel. David in front of Goliath said that, today God will deliver you into my hand that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. They are always conscious of giving God alone all the glory. Are you? Are you listening? The key to answered prayer is that you want God glorified. But let me tell you about God's glory. Every time you read the Bible that Jesus healed someone, they glorified God. Or many times in the Bible it says that, not every time, all right? But God always gets the glory when someone gets healed. Isn't it wonderful? And, and, and the people rejoiced and the people gave glory to God and God was glorified. Amen. Healing glorifies God. Isn't it wonderful? So you can pray for God's glory. Pray for His glory. Don't worry about your name being vindicated. What name? And the, the original name that we all have is four letters. W-O-R-M. Oh, you don't like it, right? Okay, it's me, it's me. Amen. Jacob's name was supplanter, wrestler, striver. Then God named him Prince. So don't forget your new name. I know you're a new creation. I know that you, you reject all these kind of things, but you know, be humble because even though you are a new creation in Christ, you cannot function based on your efforts. And if God has blessed you, give God the glory. If God uses you, it's a privilege. If God tells you to do something, it's a privilege because this guy's about to learn that right now at, at, at Mount Carmel, he told God to vindicate his name. Down here, he vindicated his name. I have been very zealous for the Lord my God. The rest are not. Have you prayed prayers like this? Or something like that? Then he says, he recite all the sins of Israel. One thing you don't do in prayer before God. All right, remember this. After you're saved, it, because you're saved, you can come to the table and eat. But the Father expects table manners. He's not going to allow one son here to criticize another son over here and a fight happens. Are you listening? Now he starts reciting the sins of Israel. This he did not do last time. So he's very discouraged. He says, I've been very zealous. I'm the only one left. The children of Israel forsook your covenant, torn down your altars, and all this is true, by the way and killed your prophets. So even if it's true, if someone has done something that you know of, it's not your place to recite their sins before God. God doesn't like that. God doesn't like that. I only am left. You know what's God's response, right? The moment you think your ministry is so important, this is what happens, all right? God's answer, or God told him to anoint a few people, but notice God's response. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel, Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. In your place. Do you hear that? God says, I'm, 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 okay, I'll bring you back home. And since you say your ministry is over, you're the only one left, I want you to know something. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Yehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Yehu, Elisha will kill. Yet, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. What did Elijah say? I'm the only one left. God says, I have 7,000. We are not the only grace church. We're not the only grace, you know, preachers. God has them all over the world. 
but make sure it's not pseudo grace, universalism, and all that kind of nonsense. You see, the moment he says, God, I'm finished, I, I, I'm discouraged, take me home. And how did God answer that prayer? In a blaze of glory, right? God took care. When it comes to ministry, the moment you don't see it as, a, as something, as a privilege anymore, you start thinking of the importance of your ministry. Let me tell you something about the Lord. He will not, the Lord will not forget one cup of cold water that's given in His name. Next on Joseph Prince. Elisha has now been anointed to succeed Elijah. Elijah learned a lesson in the cave. Elijah learned that we are all not indispensable, even in Elijah. And he learned the moment he started talking about his own importance, God raised his successor. But Elijah is a man of God. He really humbled himself. When people are praising you or not, close your door somewhere and fall on your knees and give God all the glory. We are nothing, we are dust and flesh. God is everything. Okay? Amen? Yes, we are still the righteousness of God in Christ. But once in a while, we need to stop and remember, without God, we cannot. Without us, He will not, I know that. But without God, we cannot. When you realize that you're not indispensable, when you realize that whatever you have is from God, there's a privilege to serve Him. Amen. Dear friends, thank you for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe if you have been blessed. For a wider selection of recent episodes and programs, head over to josephprince.tv. You can sign up for an account. It is completely free. And if it is your first time, we also want to send you a teaching resource as a gift from me to you. Thanks again for watching. I look forward to staying connected with you at josephprince.tv. God bless.